If you have your Bibles, Mark chapter 9 is where we are. Mark chapter 9. We've been going through this incredible gospel and we find ourselves after the Mount of Transfiguration, the disciples with Jesus, Peter, James, and John, they're walking down and they are seeing a commotion in front of them that we pick up in verse 14. Let's read it together. Mark writes, When they came back to the disciples, that's Jesus, Peter, James, and John, came back to the disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and some scribes arguing with them. Immediately when the entire crowd saw him, they were amazed and they began running up to greet him. And he asked them, what are you discussing with them? One of the crowd answered, teacher, I brought you my son possessed with a spirit which makes him mute. And whenever it sees it's him, it slams him to the ground and he foams at the mouth and he grinds his teeth and stiffens out. I told your disciples to cast it out and they could not do it. And Jesus answered them and said, oh, unbelieving generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring him to me. And they brought the boy to him. And when he saw him, immediately the spirit threw him into a convulsion and falling to the ground, he began rolling around and foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. It has often thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can, all things are possible to him who believes. Immediately, the boy's father cried out and said, I do believe. Help my unbelief. When Jesus saw that a crowd was rapidly gathering, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, You deaf and mute spirit, I command you, come out of him and do not enter him again. After crying out and throwing him into terrible convulsions, it came out. And the boy became so much like a corpse that most of them said, He is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and raised him and he got up. And when he came into the house, his disciples began questioning him privately. Why could we not drive it out? And he said to them, this kind cannot come out by anything but prayer. These are the words of our gracious God. Let's pray and ask his blessing on the preaching of his word. Father, we thank you for another opportunity that we have to open the Bible, to open your holy, inspired, inerrant, infallible word. It is authoritative, it is sufficient, it is clear, and it is for us. We get to hear you speak. We get to listen to you. We get to watch as you interact with your people. And so we come before you expectant. We come before you hopeful. We come before you longing. God, we long for our faith to grow. We pray with the Father, Lord, we believe, but help our unbelief. And we ask that you would do that even in our midst today. Grow in us a greater faith in Christ. But God, I pray that we would not cling to our faith for hope but we would cling to Christ and his holding of us no matter what. So Holy Spirit, open our eyes to behold wonderful things from your law this morning. May we see Christ. May we love him more. We pray it in his name. Amen. There are three realities regarding faith that we see in these verses. Reality number one, faith falters when we fail to fixate on Christ. Faith falters when we fail to fixate on Christ. This is verses 14 through 19. Again, Jesus, Peter, James, and John are walking down the Mount of Transfiguration. 
They were asking those questions that we saw last Lord's Day in verses 9 through 13. And when they get back down the mountain, they see a massive commotion. But notice, right off the bat, they had an amazing mountaintop experience. And mountaintop experiences are wonderful. They're great. Sometimes we need them. But God never intends for us to stay on the mountain. He's bringing his disciples back down to this valley, to this chaos, to this commotion, because he wants us down here. He wants us in the midst of the chaos. Sometimes we want to be removed from it. And God says, no, 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 this is where you're supposed to be. They come back, they see a large crowd. So they come back to the other nine disciples. They see a large crowd around the disciples. They see some scribes who are arguing with the crowd and with the disciples specifically. The scribes are there. They're probably mocking the disciples because as we read, there is a father who has brought his demon-possessed son to be healed by the disciples. And the disciples could do it back in chapter six. They can't do it here. And so the scribes are probably mocking these disciples saying, you don't have power because you are following somebody who is a fraud. And in the midst of the mocking, in the midst of the ridicule, Jesus shows up in verse 15. Immediately when the entire crowd sees him, they're amazed. They know he can do something about this, even if his disciples can't. And so they run up to greet him. The Greek word is more of a sense of tackling him, running up and tackling him. They are pressing in all around him. And he asks them, what are you discussing with them? Now, there's a lot of thems in this text. So who are the thems? I believe that it's most likely he is asking the scribes, what are you discussing with my disciples? And I love that because I think that Jesus is protecting his disciples. He is saying, scribes, you were here while I was gone and you could be weaseling your way in and trying to sow seeds of unbelief. What were you telling them? I want to protect my disciples. I want to care for my disciples. But in the midst of this, if this is also directed to the crowd, what are you, what are you guys all talking about? Maybe even the disciples are included. The disciples don't speak. They don't speak up because they are embarrassed. Their answer would be, uh, the commotion is because we stink. That would be their answer. We have failed. We are failures. That's why everybody's making fun of us. So they don't speak. But the father speaks. Verse 17. One of the crowd. This is the dad. This is the father of the boy. He says, teacher, I brought you my son. I brought you, so I wanted to get to you. You were gone, but your disciples are an extension of you. So I brought my boy to you. And he's possessed with a spirit, which makes him mute. Whenever it seizes him, it slams him to the ground. He foams at the mouth. There's a, a sound here of um, epileptic symptoms. So it looks like epilepsy. It looks like seizures and it is demon possession together. He grinds his teeth. He stiffens out. Imagine how this father is pleading with Jesus as he's saying these words. We can read words in the scriptures so formulaically, so academically, but please dive into the text in such a way where you can see it in your mind's eye and you can hear the tone in this man's voice, you can see the tears streaming down his face. Imagine this is your child and you're just begging, God, please, if you can do anything about this situation, can you help? In Luke chapter 9, verse 38, the parallel passage, it tells us that this man says, he is my only child. He's my only child. Please help. He says, I told your disciples to cast him out. This demon cast it out of my son, but they could not do it. They couldn't do it. They could, back in chapter 6, they had the power given to them by Jesus to cast out demons, but they can't hear. And Jesus, in response to that, in verse 19 says, O unbelieving generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? 
Oh, unbelieving generation. So again, we have another question. Who is involved in this generation? Is he speaking specifically to the scribes, specifically to the dad, specifically to the crowds, or to the disciples? I I think it's probably everybody altogether because generation can be used to say everybody. But that does include the disciples. They are unbelieving. They're struggling to cast the demon out. And because of their struggle in believing in Jesus... They can't cast this demon out. And Jesus marvels at their failure to believe. Why? Because they have been given more than enough evidence to believe. You realize God does not ask you to believe in him out of thin air. He doesn't say, believe in me just because I said so. And I'm going to give you no warrant, no proof, no evidence. No, he gives us so much evidence That unbelief is really a rejection of divine revelation. And that's why we see Jesus being wearied by their unbelief. It is wearisome to Jesus as he gives people evidence and they do not believe. Now, why don't they believe? There's a number of reasons why, but here, amidst the crowd, they are fixing their eyes on the problem, namely this demon-possessed boy, and they're not fixing their eyes on Jesus. Jesus is here in their midst, and they see him, but they're still anxious. They're fixating on the problem, and they want Jesus to fix their problem while they are not fixating on him. We see this example with Peter. You remember him walking on the water. Jesus says, come to me, and he walks out, and he steps out on the water, and he starts walking on the waves. But the moment that he takes his eyes off of Christ and fixates on the water, on the waves, on the storm, that's when he fails. That's when he falters. That's when he sinks. Take your eyes off of Christ and your faith will falter. So can I just ask you this morning, what's going on in your life right now? Where your eyes are fixated on a problem, an issue, and you're pleading with Jesus to Fix that issue, but your eyes aren't fixed on him. They're fixed on that issue. Maybe it's a relationship that you have. Maybe there's stress in your family. Maybe it's a job, a problem at work or a problem getting a job. Maybe it's your health. Maybe it's searching for a church building. And your eyes just fixate on the issue. And you're praying, but your eyes aren't fixed on Christ. Faith falters when we fail to fixate on Christ. Number two, second reality about faith. Faith can be small and can grow. Faith can be small and can grow. This is verses 20 through 27. Jesus says at the end of verse 19, bring him to me. And they bring the boy to Jesus. Again, we see the beauty. We've seen it over and over again in this gospel. We see it here again, the beauty of bringing somebody to Jesus. When you don't know what to do, go to Jesus. That's always the best thing to do in the midst of chaos. They bring him to Jesus. And when the boy and the demon in the boy sees Jesus, immediately the spirit throws him into a convulsion. He falls to the ground. He begins rolling around and foaming at the mouth. This demon is probably terrified of Jesus, doesn't want to be cast out, also might be doing some theatrics here to terrify Jesus, and Jesus is so unfazed by anything that's happening. As this boy is going through all of this crazy demonic activity, Jesus turns to the dad in verse 21 and asks one of my favorite questions in the entire Bible. I love this question. He turns to the father in verse 21 and he says, how long has this been happening to him? How long has this been happening? Now, the reason why I love that question is because it is completely unnecessary, right? It's not like Jesus is saying, how long has this been happening? Because I need to adjust my dial of, you know, this has been 12 years. Okay, adjust it. And then power for 12 years. He doesn't need to know this answer to do this miracle, right? This, This question has zero influence and impact on the miracle he's about to do. So why does he ask it? He asks it because he loves this man. He cares 
for this man. He sees the boy and he turns to the dad. And in essence, he's saying, this has has got to be torture watching your son go through this. How long has this been happening to your son? How long have you been having to see this happen? How long have you been witnessing him go through this? He cares for his heart. He draws out the issue. He spends the time to care and to love this father. And I just wonder, do we do the same? Do we spend the time to ask the questions that really don't pertain to any solution? They just show that we care about the people next to us. Yes, it takes time. Must learn patience to do it. But learn from your Savior. Ask those questions. Take, those, take that time. The man answers from childhood. And then he describes that it's often thrown this boy into the fire and into the water, either to burn him to death or to drown him to death. And then he says this, and this is where Jesus' question has drawn out this man's heart all the way out. He says, but if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. This is the real issue for this man. What he's saying in essence is, we have tried everything. We think that this situation is hopeless. Can you do anything about it? Can you do anything? Is there anything that can be done to fix this situation? But he's asking something even deeper than that. Because he says, if you can. Jesus, do you have the ability? Remember back in chapter one, we met a leper and the leper was so amazing in his faith with Jesus where he said, I know you can. I just don't know if you're willing. If you're willing, you can make me clean. I know you can make me clean, but are you willing? Here, the dad is saying the opposite. I know that you're willing. You're here. I know that you're willing. You care for me. You love me. I just don't know if you can. I don't know if you can. And that's why Jesus says, if you can, oh, I can. I can do all things. All things are possible to him who believes. If you can, I can do all things. I can do all things. And not only can Jesus do all things, but those who would place their faith in him can be beneficiaries of being able to do all things. Now, obviously the all things doesn't mean all things doesn't mean every everything, doesn't mean you can jump off the balcony and flap your wings and fly if you have enough faith. That's not what this is saying. Clearly, the all things can't mean sin, right? It can't include sin. To him who believes, you can sin. No, that's not what this means. So all things can't mean every single thing. There's a confining of what all things means. It's governed by the context of this passage. Namely, that the disciples could not, what they could not do in their flesh, Jesus could do, in order to accomplish his will. So I can do all things according to God's will if it fits in God's will, if I have faith in him. By the way, just side note, this is really important because this is a verse that is used uh, abusively, incorrectly, harmfully, painfully, hurtfully to say that if you are sick and you have not been healed, it's because you don't have enough faith. I've actually been the recipient of that statement before. I asked an individual to pray for me one time and I said, would you pray that if it be the Lord's will, I would be healed? And this individual said, it's always the Lord's will that you'd be healed. It's you that's standing in the way of your healing. I thought, wow. Imagine if that were true. It's not, it's absolutely unbiblical. But imagine if that were true. I have a friend, uh, more of an acquaintance, but I have somebody that I've talked to about this who has uh, polio, who is in a a wheelchair, has to walk around with canes and then uh, moves around in a wheelchair. He said that he went to a faith healing rally one time and went up on stage. Somebody prayed over him to be healed and, and he wasn't healed. And the pastor person said, you don't have enough faith to be healed. It's your fault. And this individual correctly said, well, then if I don't have enough faith to have physical healing, there's no way I have enough faith to be spiritually healed. So therefore I can't ever be saved. 
I must never have the ability to be saved because I don't even have enough faith just to be healed physically. And they just walked away from the faith. They said, that's it, I'm done. And then they heard the true gospel. They heard a true understanding, not only of this text, but of the Bible. And they came to Christ. They just fell in love with Jesus. And now they go around the world telling everybody what the truth of the scriptures says. The reality is sometimes God says no, even to the most ardent of our prayers. Think of Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. He prays three times that the thorn in his flesh would be removed. Some people think that that's literal physical healing. He's praying for physical, uh, a physical ailment to be removed. Some people think it's a friend uh, that was a really bad friend. Some people think it's a demon-possessed oppressor. We don't know exactly what it is, but we know that Paul is praying, God, please take that away. And God says, I'm not going to. And his answer is not because you don't have enough faith. His answer is, I want my strength to be made perfect in your weakness. So literally, because you have enough faith, because you believe in me, I want to show you even stronger power because of your faith in me. So I'm going to answer no. I'm not going to take away the thorn in the flesh. So literally, his, if it was a physical ailment, his physical ailment is not taken away because he has great faith. So to say that this verse means you are not being healed because you don't have enough faith is really to not only misinterpret and misunderstand this verse, but misunderstand the Bible. Look at the book of Job. That's, you're being like Job's friends at that point, right? If you believe that and if you say that, you're being like Job's friends who say, well, Job, all these bad things happened to you because something you did. And God ends up speaking up and saying, actually, no, you were wrong. He did nothing. So then what does Jesus mean when he says this? He says ultimately that by faith in him, since he can do all things, that power can be yours as well. Meaning God is never limited by your limited faith. That's not the issue. God's power is unlimited regardless of your faith. The issue in these verses is not our inability to do something but the emphasis is on God's ability. All things are possible. If you can, I can. And if you connect yourself to me, then you get all the benefits. He can do all things. Faith, in reality, it's like an extension cord. You plug in, there's so many extension cords here. You plug in an extension cord, to get power. Now, does the power that you receive come from the extension cord? No, it comes from the wall. It comes from the outlet. It comes from wherever the power behind the outlet comes from. I don't know. It comes from that little white thing. So faith is like an extension cord. An extension cord all wrapped up has zero power, right? And even when you plug it in, the extension cord doesn't have the power. You've just connected to the power source. Faith is a connection of yourself to Jesus. He is the power source. So please don't ever trust in your faith. Don't have faith in your faith. Don't trust the power cord. Don't trust the extension cord. Trust the power flowing through the extension cord. Trust the Lord. So the reality is, Jesus is saying, it's not if God can do this. God can do anything that is in his nature to do. The question is, will you come to him for help? Are you coming to him for help or are you going somewhere else for help? Jesus, after saying this, hears such an amazing statement in verse 24. This is a verse that I think we should all Memorize, this is a prayer. It's a very easy verse to memorize. It's a prayer that we should all memorize. His answer, this father's answer is remarkable. He says, he cries out, I do believe and help my unbelief. I do believe, but I know I have unbelief and I need help. This man gives voice to a paradox that we all feel. I believe and I also don't believe. I believe and I have doubt. This is our experience. In the tangle of the human heart, we do believe and we do disbelieve at the exact same time. I do believe, but I'm struggling and I doubt. 
Notice, this man says, I believe, but I'm also struggling with unbelief. But that unbelief, that struggle and doubt has not kept him from taking his boy to Jesus. And that's all it takes. Weak, frail, broken, even doubting faith, but faith that is in God is more than enough faith. That's all you need. The most important thing about faith is not the amount that you have, but the object of your faith. Even small faith is real faith if the object is true. That's why I say for point number two, faith can be small. Faith can be small and as we pray, help my unbelief, faith can grow. Think about an illustration. Let's see, there's two people that are walking out onto a frozen lake. One person lives right next to that lake and knows exactly when that lake is perfectly frozen over and you can walk out, you can skate on it, you can do whatever you want. And so they just walk right out onto it. The other person is not from that location, terrified, thinks that the ice is going to snap at any moment, but walks out with his friend onto the ice. Two people, very different faith in the ice to keep them out of the water. Which outcome does each of them experience? Is there a difference in their outcome because of their faith? No, they both walk across the frozen ice. They both walk across. One has strong faith, one has weak faith, but they walk across. There is no difference. Even though they have a difference in their faith, there's no difference in the change of the strength of the ice or the outcome of them walking on it. Because small faith is still genuine faith if the object of your faith is true. Or another illustration, think of somebody putting on a parachute. Let's say a plane is about to go down and there's parachutes and, and there's a, a paratrooper sitting next to just a common civilian. And the paratrooper just thinks, this is a normal day at work for me. I've jumped out of planes hundreds of times, puts on the parachute, getting ready to go. And the common civilian is out of their mind, just freaking out, terrified, but puts the parachute on and follows the paratrooper out the door. Will there be a difference in their outcomes of landing safely on the ground because of their different levels of faith in the parachute to save them? No, they both put it on because the issue is not the weakness or the strength of their faith in the parachute. The issue is the strength of the parachute. If you have small faith, but it's genuine faith, if the object that you believe in is true, you can have small faith, but it is still genuine faith if the object that you believe in is true. And this, brothers and sisters, this is wonderful news because Hebrews chapter 11, verse six says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. And I think all of us would say, we don't have the kind of faith that we wish we had. We want to grow in our faith. We want to strengthen our faith. We're struggling with faith. And Jesus would say, you know what? If you even have a tiny little bit of faith, you have enough. If it's in me, it's pleasing if it's in him. Faith can be genuine faith no matter how small because the true nature of faith is not the faith itself, but the object of that faith. The key is not the depth of our faith, but the direction of our faith. A little faith in a great savior gets you amazing results. So if you ever find yourself doubting, do what this man does. With weak, frail, broken, struggling faith, he still takes his son to Jesus. I don't even know if you can heal him, Jesus, but I'm still taking him to you. This man doesn't withdraw. He doesn't resign himself into bitterness or doubt. No, he goes to Jesus. He doesn't let his struggle with faith stop him from going to Jesus. Doubt is real. The Bible says so. The Bible says that our doubt is real. And Jude 22 says we're supposed to have mercy on those who are doubting. So in your doubt, in your struggle, take your doubts and your unbelief to Jesus because your faith will grow as you get a clearer view of who Jesus is. Your faith is based on the object of what you're believing in. So turn to Jesus. Faith means that you're not going to run away from those doubts. You're going to take your doubts to Christ. If you're struggling in your faith this morning, 
you have doubts, you have concerns, you have questions, one of the best things you can do is act like you have faith. Go to Jesus. Do what you know you would be doing if you had faith and let God work in your heart to grow your faith. Go through those motions and let God change your heart as you do, just like this man. This man doesn't say, I'm not gonna take my boy until I have full confidence that Jesus can do this. No, he says, I'm gonna interact with Jesus with my doubts and watch him work in my heart. This, this dad is even saying, you know what? I don't even know if you can help my boy, but can you help my faith? Can you help my faith? Can you grow greater faith in me? Even here this morning, if you're struggling with doubt, or you're struggling with faith, a desire for greater faith is an expression of faith. Wanting to want to change is an expression of faith. So turn to Christ, turn in his direction, move towards him and totally depend on him alone. Faith is a total dependence in God and his all-sufficient power, and it's a coming to him for help. Faith is coming to him for help. Faith, I love the way that John Calvin says it, faith is not looking far off at Jesus, but it's coming to him with a warm embrace and letting him warmly embrace you. Jesus, upon hearing that statement, verse 25 he sees that the crowd is gathering. You remember, he's trying to train his disciples, and so he wants to heal this boy quickly so that the crowd doesn't stall them from continuing their ministry and uh, the training of the 12. So he rebukes the unclean spirit, and he says to it, you deaf and mute spirit, I command you, come out of him and do not enter him again. There's two things interesting about that. Number one, the I is in the emphatic position in the sentence, so Jesus is saying, I, even I myself, I'm the one doing this. I command you. But number two, he speaks directly to the demon and he says, you deaf and mute spirit. The dad had said, my boy is mute. The dad did not say his boy was deaf. And so I wonder if this is the first time that the dad's realizing there was a problem even with his hearing. So Jesus commands the unclean spirit. Don't even enter him again. Come out and don't enter him again. And I love the next verse because just like real life, we come to Jesus, please take care of my problem. He says, yes, I will. And the very next thing looks like it's gotten worse, right? This is so real life, similar to real life. Just as you come to faith, come to Jesus in faith, things seem to get worse around you. The boy, after crying out, throwing him into terrible convulsions, he comes out and the boy becomes so much like a corpse that most of them say he's dead. People think he actually died. Now, I don't know if he actually died or if he just looked dead, but the next verse says that Jesus took him by the hand and raised him. That's resurrection language. So it actually could be that this boy died and Jesus raised him from the dead. Or it could be that this boy just looked like he was dead and Jesus still with resurrection language is raising him up off the ground. But it's language that would have been familiar to the disciples when they hear or see Jesus raising him, they would have remembered Jesus said, I will be raised on the third day. There's a resurrection language here. There's hope. And he gets up. He gets up. Jesus did what the disciples could not do. He responds to the father's doubting faith. And my friends, he's ready to respond to your faith, however small it might be. He's ready to respond right now to your doubts, to your struggles, to your concerns, to your questions, to your fears and to your wrestling. He's ready to respond to you. So come to him knowing that faith can be small. That's okay, as long as it's in Christ. And come to him knowing that faith can grow. Place your confidence in Jesus to help you grow. Lastly, number three, last two verses. Faith relies on God, not on self. Faith relies on God, not on self. This is verses 28 and 29. They leave pretty quickly because again, the crowd is forming. Jesus wants to train his disciples and they are in for a lesson here. They get back into a house. His disciples are questioning him and they say privately, just the 13 of them, 12 disciples and Jesus, why could we 
not drive it out. Now, I love this because their failure leads them to question themselves. And that's a good thing. Failure is not a bad thing because failure can lead you to question where you're at. Often God allows this to happen in our lives, allows you to come to the end of yourself so that you see he's the only way for these things to be fixed. There are countless struggles that are beyond us. So don't be surprised when we go through trials that show us that we desperately need him. And when we get to that place where only he's left, right? You've been there before where you feel like, I can't go anywhere else. He's the only hope that I have. We should be reminded in that place that he was the very first place we should have gone for help. He's the first place we should always look to for help. I'm reminded of that all the time by dear brothers and sisters in this church. I'm reminded by our brother Jose as we go driving around looking at properties. We have our own human intuition and wisdom and discernment and abilities. But we will not find anything if God doesn't open the door for us. So we stop, we pray, God, please help us. I remember I was working on my water heater with our dear brother Phil. When I say I was working on, Phil was working on it. I was watching him. And I remember uh, we were both struggling with trying everything. I was watching YouTubes. Uh, He was doing his thing. And he goes, you know, we haven't prayed. It's one of those moments that just your faith is revealed in front of your eyes. This is typically the way my faith works. I go, well, of course we haven't because God doesn't care about this. Right? God's dealing with big issues. You know, earthquakes and hurricanes and cancer and heart attacks. God's dealing with big things. He doesn't care about a water heater, right? These are first world problems. And Phil says, we haven't prayed. And he stops right then and there. We're all sweaty, laying down on the ground. We pray. The very next thing he tries works, right? The very next thing fixes the water heater. God takes us to the end of ourselves in big things, yes, but also in the everyday little things to remind us we always need to go to him first. Also, this text encourages me Because these disciples have been following Jesus for a long time. It's been a few years now. And they're still messing up. The longer you follow Jesus doesn't equal the easier things will get. The longer you follow him, actually, as you walk with him, he'll be giving you harder and harder tasks to go through. And when you begin to rely on your own strength, you're going to fall right in the same trap as the disciples. And you're going to be reminded, I need to rely on him And him alone. They say, Why could we not drive it out? And Jesus says to them in verse 29, This kind cannot come out by anything but prayer. This kind, kind of what? Some people would take it to mean like this kind of demon, this like species of demon. The other demons you don't need to pray over, but this demon you do. I don't think that that's the case. I think he means this kind of circumstance, this kind of issue, this spiritual conflict, demon possession, and other conflicts like it. They require prayer. He's saying this, once you take to the spiritual battlefield, in any area of life, not just with demon possession, but in any area, once you take the spiritual battlefield, if you go to that battlefield in your own strength, in your own pride, or in your own self-sufficiency, you've already lost the battle before it even began. That's what Jesus is saying. You cannot do anything in a spiritual conflict that will be successful in any way if you don't pray. Now, why did the disciples not pray? I think there's two main reasons why they didn't pray. Number one, they had been given the power over unclean spirits in Mark 6, and they had driven out demons. And I think that they are still living off of that experience, their past triumphs. And they think, we don't need to depend on Jesus. We can depend on ourselves. We have the power. We did it once before. We can do it again. But past triumphs do not mean present victories. You have to keep going back to Jesus. But the second reason, and I think the most contextual reason why they couldn't cast this demon out, 
is the same reason why Peter, James, and John were on the Mount of Transfiguration. You remember, why did they go on the Mount of Transfiguration? Jesus said, come with me. I'm going to show you my glory, the glory of the kingdom. Why did they need that? Remember, all the synoptic gospels put the Mount of Transfiguration right after, immediately after, Jesus telling the disciples for the very first time he's going to die. And so Peter, James, and John, and the rest of the disciples are thinking, I think we're following the wrong guy. Messiah doesn't die. I think, I think he's a fraud. I think he's a fake. I think we've made a mistake. They're confused. They're struggling. They might be bitter. They might be angry. And so Jesus takes Peter, James, and John on to the Mount of Transfiguration to show them, you're not wrong. You didn't put your trust in me in vain. I am who I say I am. It was that spiritual red bull like we talked about, right? A boost of their faith. But the other nine disciples didn't get that. And so they moved from, I'm going to die, straight to, can you heal my boy? So I think that they're probably saying, uh, sure, yeah, we can. Let's pray over him in the name of Jesus, who we thought he was the Messiah. We're not really sure now. We hope he is, but probably not. Be healed. That's not faith in Jesus. So they're not praying in a way where they're connecting themselves to Jesus. Why? Because they don't know if Jesus is who he said he was. He says, I am Messiah and I'm going to die. And they go, those don't work together. Something cancels the other one out. And so in their struggle to believe, they cannot exercise this demon because they don't trust Jesus, who was the power initially in Mark chapter 6 that enabled them and gave them authority. The bottom line, though, is they weren't praying. They weren't praying. Self-dependence, self-reliance was the root of their inability. Why don't we pray? We don't pray for two reasons. We don't pray either because we don't think we have to, like I did with the water heater. Nah, I've got this one. God's already busy with other things. Or you don't think God can do it. You genuinely don't think. If you can, help, but I don't think you can. Prayerlessness is an indication of self-reliance. That's why Paul tells us in 1 Timothy 5, 17, pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. That doesn't mean always be praying uh, verbally. Um, where I'm not praying right now verbally. I'm talking right now. But I can still be talking and preaching with an attitude that is dependent on Jesus. Saying, God, help me. Be my help. And that constant dependent on Jesus is the attitude of prayer that Paul is talking about. Pray without ceasing. Be connected to Christ without ceasing. Depend on him. Plead with him. Ask him. Talk to him without ceasing. And God's power comes abundantly to those who humbly rely on him. This, by the way, is a lesson the disciples needed to learn because they thought Jesus isn't who he said he is and he's gone. We have to do this on our own strength. And Jesus is telling them, I'm going to be gone in a couple years or in a couple months at this point. I'm going to be gone forever. You're not going to see me for a long, long time. And this isn't the way ministry can work. You, you don't get power because I'm there. And then when I'm gone, you're doing this on your own power. No, you need to abide in me, right? John 15, you need to abide in me. John 16, I'm going to send my helper. You need to depend on him. This is a lesson that they needed to learn right here. And crucially, depend on on him. Until we admit that we can't, then we never can. You can either jump out of that plane with the parachute marked faith, or you can jump out with no parachute and your arms flapping called self-reliance. But we need to admit we can't. We can't. And that will lead us to plead with the Lord for greater faith. So what do you do to get more faith? What do you do to grow your faith? And what would it look like if you had more faith? What do you do to get more faith? And what would it look like if you had more faith? Good news, the answer to both of those questions is the same. It's prayer. What does it look like to get more faith? Pray. Ask God. He's the author of your faith. Hebrews chapter 12. Go to him and say, please give me more faith. And then what does it look like to have more faith? Praying. Being connected to Christ in utter dependence. Come before Jesus as your heavenly father. It's like my kids Right around uh, Christmas time, right before Christmas time, usually end of October into November, we get those magazines from stores that you know have um, Christmas wish lists, and they have all the toys. And my kids take them and just intuitively, we don't even have to tell them. They just intuitively open it and get a sharpie and mark. I want this. I want that. I don't want that. And they just go through it. 
And I love that because that is a picture of faith. That what they're saying is, number one, I know I can't buy this. So I'm, I'm circling things that only mommy and daddy can get from me because I know I can't buy this. Number two, uh, I think that they're willing to buy it. They bought me things in the past. And so never hurts to circle it and say, dad, this is what I want. That's, that's what faith is. Faith is saying, I can't get this on my own. I know you can get it for me. And I think you're willing. And I'm going to ask you. And if you're here this morning and you have never done that with Jesus ever, that's what salvation looks like. Salvation looks like coming to Jesus saying, I can't do this on my own. I am a sinner. I am condemned to die for my sins. I should be punished because of my sin, my guilt, my shame. All of that needs to be dealt with and I can't deal with it. I can't change my heart. I can't fix the issues going on in my soul. So you come to Jesus. Jesus, will you help me? You can do it. Can you save me? That's what saving faith is. Faith in Jesus instead of in yourself. Through Jesus, we don't need perfect righteousness or perfect faith. We just need a repentant helplessness to access the presence of God. Perfect righteousness is impossible for us. And if you were to wait for that to go to God, if you were to wait to be perfectly holy to go to God, then you're never going to go to God. So you must admit that you're not righteous. You need help. And when you say that, you are approaching God in the way that a repentant believer does. So pursue the Lord in repentant helplessness today. For some of you, maybe for the very first time. For others, it's the ongoing fight of faith. As a believer, pursue the Lord. Can I just encourage you as we wrap up? Number one, recognize your doubts. Realize they're real. Don't run away from them. Take them to the Lord. Be honest about them. But number two, as you're praying for faith, dive into God's word. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So grow greater faith in Christ by growing your love for the scriptures. If you're not in the word, don't expect your faith to be strong. So read the word, believe the word, apply the word. Faith falters when we fail to fix our eyes on Christ. Faith can be small and can grow. And faith is fully reliant on God, never on self. Because we never advance beyond our need for faith. We never advance beyond our need for prayer because we never advance beyond our need for Jesus. So how's your faith? How deep are your doubts? What are your doubts? Where do you turn? Will you turn to Jesus today? And if you think, you know what? I'd like to turn to Jesus, but why should I? What, what has he done to show me that he's trustworthy? What, what has he done to warrant my faith in him? Well, just as the father in this story loves his son and would do anything to save his son, so too our heavenly father loves his only begotten son and would do anything for him. But instead of saving Jesus from the cross, our heavenly father actually led Jesus to the cross and crushed him, Isaiah 53, under the penalty that we deserve, under our wrath that was righteously stored up for us. He killed Jesus instead of us so that we could be saved and not crushed. What has Jesus done to warrant our trust? He has loved us to the very end. He has died in our place. He submitted himself to the Father's will to bear our punishment. So turn to the one who loves you more than you could possibly imagine. Trust him. And even though this life is filled with much difficulty, sorrow, suffering, and trials, cling to Jesus by faith, knowing that he will never lose his grip on you. Don't trust your faith to hold on to him. Trust his grip to hold on to you, even in the weakness of your faith. And one day soon, brothers and sisters, one day very soon, our faith will be sight and we will see him face to face. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the opportunity that we have every Lord's Day to open your precious holy word and stare at Christ. And we stare at him and we say with the Father in this text, God, we believe, but we're struggling. Help our unbelief. God, help our doubts. Help us to know that we don't need to grow stronger faith on our own before we come to you. No, in the weakness of our faith, we come to you and you are the one that grows it in us. God, help us, encourage us, challenge us, comfort us. 
And help us to cling to Jesus even now as we trust in him. Not I, but Christ in me. Not me and my ability to cling to him, but Christ and his promise to hold me fast to the end. We pray it in his name. Amen.